Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this video we will cover how local and systemic recovery capacity influence hypertrophy training. First, let's explore what systemic recovery capacity is. Systemic recovery refers to the total amount of training that we can recover and adapt to. We often hear about strength athletes talk about strength reductions due to CNS fatigue, but it is difficult to specifically pinpoint the central nervous system. Rather, it is probably some combination of inhibited function from the nervous system and hormonal system. However, we don't know exactly what systems are impacted, but we do know that doing too much hard training certainly impacts performance. Therefore, we simply use the term systemic capacity as a general meaning for the total amount of training that can be handled by the entire organism. Breaching systemic recovery capacity can be made analogous to a bucket of water. The water is our training and the bucket is our capacity. There is only a certain amount of water that the bucket can hold before it is full. If we continue to add water beyond this point, then the bucket cannot contain this extra water and overflows. So how do we know where the limit of our systemic recovery capacity lies? Well, the only true way to test this is using performance. If we continue to train with more volume over time and performance starts to decline, then we've probably reached our systemic recovery capacity. However, there are other indicators of this, including a lack of motivation to train, lethargy, and poor sleep. However, these are only indicators that we are breaching our systemic recovery capacity and can also occur when training with adequate volumes. Now that we understand what our systemic recovery capacity is, let's now explore what local recovery capacity means. Local recovery capacity simply refers to the amount of work that an individual tissue can recover from. In relation to hypertrophy training, there are two primary types of tissue that we are concerned with. These are the muscles and joints. The recovery capacity of our muscles refers to how much work can be performed, recovered from and adapted to. There is a limit to how much work an individual muscle group can perform before it can no longer actually grow from the stimulus. However, this is generally not reached for trainees training the entire body because systemic fatigue and joint tolerance usually give out before the muscle reaches its maximum hypertrophic potential. This leads us to the next form of local recovery capacity, which is joint and connective tissues. This refers to how much work can be performed by a specific joint before it starts to elicit a pain response. Pain is an extremely complex phenomenon and we cannot specifically pinpoint what the actual pathology is, but all we need to know is that there is a limit to how much total work each joint can handle before we start to feel acute or chronic pain. For lifters, this normally presents as lingering dull aches in certain joints, which slowly starts to get worse over time. So now we've explored systemic and local recovery capacities, let's now cover what factors actually contribute to inducing fatigue. Let's explore which training variables contribute to fatigue and how these relate to hypertrophy training. The first factor is exercise selection. Certain exercises can be more or less demanding from a systemic perspective and from a local perspective. Generally speaking, exercises which have high stability demands and involve multiple muscle groups are the most systemically fatiguing. For example, barbell back squats are probably going to be more systemically fatiguing than a leg press. In terms of local fatigue of the joints, different exercises seem to feel more or less taxing for different people. This is usually quite individual, so each trainee needs to experiment with what exercises provide a good stimulus to the target muscle and don't cause joint pain over time. The next factor that contributes to recovery capacity is the load used. Generally, heavier loads cause more local and systemic fatigue than lighter loads. However, with hypertrophy training, we are almost always working in the 6 to 20 rep range, so the loading of our exercises doesn't change too much. However, to limit systemic and local fatigue, trainees can use the higher end of these rep ranges for exercises which are practical to do so. And lastly, we have volume. Volume is the biggest training variable which will contribute to fatigue because other variables remain fairly constant with hypertrophy training. Volume refers to how many total sets are trained per muscle group per week. So basically the rest of this video will refer to volume as the key contributor to fatigue and recovery capacity. This leads us to the volume hypertrophy relationship. We will now cover how volume impacts hypertrophy from an individual muscle group standpoint and from a systemic standpoint. The volume hypertrophy relationship describes the relationship between volume and muscle growth for an individual muscle group. This seems to follow an inverted U-shaped relationship, which means that more volume is better up to a point, and performing more volume beyond this point results in less muscle growth. So basically there is a sweet spot which results in the best response for each individual muscle group. We call this sweet spot maximum adaptive volume. 
However, trainees usually train all or most muscle groups of the body, not one or two individual muscles. Therefore, we need to consider the systemic response of the trainee. In other words, how much total volume can be performed by the trainee and still result in performance improvements. As we already established, there is a limit to how much total volume can be performed before it breaches our systemic recovery capacity and performance declines. This relates to hypertrophy training because the sum of maximum adaptive volumes of each muscle group is greater than our systemic recovery capacity. In other words, if we train all our muscles at their maximum adaptive level, we will be performing too much volume to systemically recover from. So what practical applications does this have for trainees seeking to maximize muscle growth? Well, firstly, because we cannot train all muscle groups at maximum adaptive levels simultaneously, we cannot maximize the rate of muscle growth for all muscle groups at the same time. Therefore, trainees should allocate volume based on preference. So we can perform more volume for the muscle groups that we want to emphasize and less volume for those that we don't. And this volume allocation can be adjusted over time based on the current goals of the individual. Let's go through some examples of this concept to help understand it. Let's say a trainee sees best muscle growth from 20 sets per muscle group per week for each individual muscle group. Maximum adaptive volume will probably be different for each muscle group in reality, but we will just use 20 sets as an example. However, as we have now just established, this trainee cannot perform 20 sets per muscle group per week for each muscle group as this will breach our systemic recovery capacity. So each muscle group will need to be trained with less volume to ensure that we can actually recover and continue to improve performance. For this first example, let's say that this trainee particularly wants to emphasize the upper body over the lower body. The trainee may then allocate volume across each muscle group in the following way. 18 sets for the chest and back, 16 sets for the biceps and triceps, and 10 sets for the quads, hamstrings, and calves. So as we can see here, the upper body uses volumes close to their maximum adaptive volume, while the lower body uses lower volumes. This will result in the upper body growing at a faster rate than the lower body as the trainee particularly wants to emphasize these muscles. This doesn't mean that the lower body won't grow at all, it simply means that these muscles will grow at a slower rate. For this second example, let's say the same trainee wants to emphasize the lower body over the upper body. Here we can see that the trainee has allocated more volume to the quads, hamstrings and calves over the chest, back and arms. So the quads, hamstrings and calves all use 18 sets per week, while the chest, back, biceps and triceps are only trained with 12 sets each. Once again, this will mean that the lower body will grow at a faster rate, while the upper body will still grow, but at a slower rate. Thanks for watching, and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.